Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bridges of Belonging. So happy to have you join us this morning and looking forward to uh, another incredible conversation where we uh, welcome and hear from Stuart McReynolds and Marnie Abbott-Peter. I'm going to uh, begin by acknowledging the traditional territory of the Coast Salish people on whose land I've had the good fortune of being safe and welcomed during COVID. Um, so I live here as a guest and um, I'm on the territories of the Songhees and the Squamalt Nations and uh, as I said just so grateful for their hospitality particularly during COVID times to have a safe place to be. Um, we are going to begin with a reading today. So it's the 10th anniversary of Brené Brown's The Gifts of Imperfection so I thought it would be uh, suiting to read from her and uh, I just spent the last week with some really incredible people through a coaching program I'm doing and um, we also referenced Brené quite a bit, so um, I wanted to reach back to this. So here we go. A deep sense of love and belonging is an irreducible need of all women, men, and children. We are biologically, cognitively, physically, and spiritually wired to love, to be loved, to belong. When those needs are not met, we don't function as we are meant to. We break, we fall apart, we numb, we ache. We hurt others, we get sick. There are certainly other causes of illness, numbing and hurt, but the absence of love and belonging will always lead to suffering. It took me three years to whittle these definitions and concepts from a decade of interviews. Let's take a look. Love, we cultivate love when we allow our most vulnerable and powerful selves to be deeply seen and known. And when we honor the spiritual connection that grows from that offering with trust, respect, kindness, and affection. Love is not something we give or get. It is something we nurture and grow. A connection that can only be cultivated when two people, between two people, when it exists within each one of them. We can only love others as much as we love ourselves. Shame, blame, disrespect, betrayal, and the withholding of affection damage the roots from which love grows. Love can only survive these injuries if they are acknowledged, healed, and rare. Belonging. Belonging is the innate human desire to be part of something larger than us. Because this yearning is so primal, we often try to acquire it by fitting in and by seeking approval, which are not only hollow substitutes for belonging, but often barriers to it. Because true belonging only happens when we present our authentic, imperfect selves to the world. Our sense of belonging can never be greater than our sense of self-acceptance. So with that, it's my pleasure to introduce our two guests today who um, really show up for me and always present their authentic selves. And so that's why I wanted to share that reading. And um, both of you have always made me feel so welcomed and like I belonged in the spaces and places that I've been with both of you. So we'll start with Stuart's introduction. So Stuart McReynolds um, brings a unique global perspective. He's worked across many countries and he's currently the president and CEO at the Ability Center. Outside of the office, Stuart has an extensive background in high performance sport, both as an athlete and a coach, and is dedicated to removing barriers to ensure equitable participation opportunities and creating environments that foster a sense of belonging. Marnie Abbott-Peter has dis enjoyed a distinguished career as one of the premier wheelchair basketball players in the world. She spent 12 years on the national team, joining in 1992, uh, where she won her first medal at the Paralympic Games in Barcelona, Spain the same year. She went on to capture two more Paralympic gold medals in 1996 and 2000, as well as a Paralympic bronze medal in 2014. 2004, sorry. Um, a former athlete turned coach, she's a leader and advocate for Paralympic sport, both on and off the court. Marnie now focuses on giving back to the wheelchair basketball community with her current role as the Let's Play Program Director for BC Wheelchair Basketball Society. Welcome to both of you. So I'm going to turn it over to you to share a little bit more about your background stories. And um, Marnie, are you up to go first? Sure. Thanks for that great introduction and that beautiful reading, Andrea. That's a really nice way to start. Um, yeah, as Andrea mentioned, um, I was a wheelchair basketball player. I'm not sure about premier in the world, but uh, was definitely on one of the top teams, which I was lucky to, to be a part of for many years. Um, I was injured in a downhill skiing accident in 1983. 
and um, started off actually in the sport of swimming. And I went to my first competition in 1986 in Puerto Rico, which was a pair of Pan Am games. And I, that was where I'd first seen wheelchair basketball being played at the elite level. And um, the coach and um, a young lady at the time named Chantal Benoit really encouraged me to get involved in wheelchair basketball and the rest of it, I guess, is just history. <laughs> Um, and now, as Andrew mentioned, I am the director of the program called Let's Play, which is um, a program that encourages physical literacy in kids with uh, physical disabilities. Here in BC, we're hoping to go national at some point, uh, but right now we're just focusing provincially and we basically just provide a little sports chair and some resources and mentorship in order to get kids off to a healthy, active start in life. It's not about wheelchair basketball at all. It's just about playing and being active. and um, giving them some skills so when they do decide to participate in sport or recreation they have some of those fundamental movement skills to get started so basically I have the best job on the planet and it's easy to go to work every day and I think my experiences as an athlete and a coach uh, lend really well to the um, mentorship I can give to kids and families in the Let's Play program now. Awesome what a fantastic introduction thank you so much Marnie. Stuart, over to you to share a little bit more about your background and story. Thanks, Andrew, and that's quite the introduction to, to Top Marnie, so uh, <laughs> I'll, do, I'll do my best there. So I guess I'll, I'll uh, start by saying uh, my preferred pronouns are he and his. Um, I've got quite uh, an eclectic background, as you can probably tell by, by my accent, as a Brit who's emigrated to, to Canada via Spain and New Zealand. Um, so I grew up in a small town uh, about 30 minutes outside of uh, North London, uh, Hitchin Hertfordshire is at the county. Um, and my passion growing up was sport. I've always been uh, connected to uh, participating in sport, both at a recreational level and a, and a, and a performance level. So I was fortunate enough to, to play um, uh, rugby at a high level in high school uh, and university, uh, representing England, Wales and Great Britain uh, at the student level. And I spent a number of years playing semi-professionally and professionally uh, across the uh, across the globe. Um, during my travels, I, I spent some time in New Zealand where I got my postgraduate diploma in secondary teaching. Uh, and that's really where uh, my um, uh, career in inclusion, accessibility and and love of this space really took off as I worked with um, uh, within special education with uh, children of all ages and abilities in, in a mainstream setting. Uh, and so uh, from then, uh, and as I hung up the rugby boots, uh, many injuries later, um, uh, I've really invested my career in support and inclusion accessibility in a variety of different roles. So uh, started off as a teacher uh, working in schools uh, to the Canadian Paralympic Committee where I managed the national education and system development programs, working with some phenomenal people, including Andrew and Marnie uh, across the country uh, to my present uh, role uh, at Ability Centre um, uh, where I'm president and CEO of an organisation uh, that works to improve quality of life uh, for people of all ages and abilities. So in a really privileged position where um, I, I'm able to influence um, the careers of young leaders in this space uh, as an employer, but also to look at some of the systemic change that we need to see uh, in our communities uh, as well. Oh, thank you, Stuart. Um, so in both of your journeys, obviously sport has been kind of a key piece of that journey for both of you. Um, tell us maybe a little bit about why you've stayed in sport as you've moved into a career path, not just as sort of players and uh, coaching as you've gone through. So Stuart, do you want to kick us off? Yeah, I think for me, um, sport is so much more than turning up and playing. It's about belonging to something bigger than yourself. And when you talk about belonging, when you're part of a team or a unit and you're all wholeheartedly 100% committed to achieving goal. It's a very special place. You know, it's, 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 you put aside your own personal ambition for the greater good of the team or the country in, in, in many cases. And so for me, that gave me my identity growing up. I was a rugby player. That was first and foremost. I was committed to, to being the best that I can be in supporting my teammates uh, on uh, and off the field. And it gave me that, that sense of identity. And I think when you see what's going on, um, in today's world and you, and you see how sport can be used as a tool, as a tool for social development and social good, 
it's um, it's something that I've I've really relished throughout my life and in in my career. And for me, that's why I've stayed connected to it. It's the memories, it's the friendships, it's the connections, it's being part of something that has the opportunity to change the social fabric of our world. Uh, and so for me, um, I wanted to give back. Uh, I'm incredibly privileged and fortunate enough to have gone through some tremendous experiences. And I want to break down barriers to ensure that others can have those same experiences. Mm, what a beautiful sentiment. Thank you for sharing that. Marnie, how about you? Wow. Um, you make me want to cry, Stuart. <laughs> <laughs> I think for me, I think um, sport is a real catalyst for positive change. And I'm a perfect example of that on an individual basis, although it can happen globally as well. But for me, um, when I first got hurt, I thought my life as an athlete was over. When I was a little girl, I dreamed of being a skier at the Olympics. I grew up in the West Kootenays, which is where Nancy Green uh, Rain was from. I don't know if you, many of you know of her, but uh, she was my idol and I wanted to be just like her. And then when I crashed and broke my back, um, I thought that part of my life was over. But luckily, while I was in rehab, I met Rick Hansen. Um, and he was actually pan planning his uh, Man in Motion World Tour at the time. And he was telling me all about this plan he had for wheeling around the world. I thought he was completely nuts. To be honest with you, I didn't think he would ever manage that. I was just like, okay, dude, you fill your boots. I could barely wheel to the cafeteria at the end of the hall in the rehab center. And here he is with these lofty goals. And, and, then, and then he did it. And for me, seeing um, a man with a dream and then accomplishing it in such a huge way. It was really, um, really inspiring for me and it really helped me understand the power of sport. And it, I think that was one of the reasons he really encouraged me to get involved. And um, once I did and I became part of the national team with wheelchair basketball, as Stuart mentioned, it, it basically became my identity and, and who I was. And when I was sitting on the podium in 92 with my Canada jersey and my gold medal around my neck and the national anthem being played and the flag being raised. I wasn't thinking to myself, geez, I wish I had been skiing today. I was just really proud of myself and my team and our country and our accomplishment. And it was a real turning point for me in terms of accepting uh, my life um, as a person with a disability. And I think it really helped my family too, understanding the scope of the Paralympics and what the power of sport could do. And it really helped them understand that I would have a positive life going forward and for myself as well. And I think just that particular moment in time, it, it, I, was, I was locked in. I mean, there was just no way that sport was ever not going to be a part of my life after that. So being involved and then as an athlete and then um, becoming a coach and coaching at that level, uh, the Canada Games level, I think... Um, there was just so much more to offer than just the on-court experience for those athletes in those teenage years. And I really felt like um, I was able to impact their lives in a very positive way, not just in basketball, but overall. So I found that very rewarding as well. And now working with the little kids, it's just another new level of that. So yeah, there's no way I'm going anywhere anytime soon. <laughs> I always love it when you describe yourself as having the best job in the world. It just like makes my heart so happy that uh, <laughs> there's people like you in the world that are doing that work and creating those opportunities for kids. And I mean, Stuart, you're doing the same thing at Ability Center and creating these welcoming environments that really just support people where they're at to um, have similar experiences to what both of you have described. So tell us a little bit about a time when you didn't belong. You've both described how sport has been such a place of belonging for you. What about a time when you didn't belong in sport or in life or whatever that might look like? Marnie, oh, Stuart, sure. go ahead. I, I, do you wanna go ahead, Stuart, or? Go ahead, Marnie. Sure, um, so as I mentioned, I, I was injured when I was 18 years old. So I was just in my first year of college and after my rehab the following year, I wanted to attend, um, to attend BCIT. I had aspirations of being a broadcast journalist. And I went to uh, BCIT and they told me, no, sorry, you're a person in a wheelchair can never do this job and you should not even be thinking about doing this. And um, I believed them. I said, okay, see you later. And just kind of left it at that. If someone had said that to me nowadays, man, it would be a different reaction for sure. But 
I, at that time, I didn't have the self-confidence or the understanding of what was available to me at all. And so I really didn't feel like I belonged there. It was really difficult for me. And then later years, I actually found out that the School of Broadcast wasn't accessible. And so that was more of the reason why they deterred me from going, because it would be really difficult on it, like physically to actually get up there to go to, to school. Um, but they changed that later and it now is accessible. And I know people with disabilities who have gone through their program. So it's been great to see that change. Shortly after that, so because I was not encouraged to go there, I went to UBC um, and was taking some psychology and phys ed classes. And I just found that post-secondary environment extremely difficult because I didn't have the self-confidence um, physically I was wheeling from one end of campus to the other end to try and make it to classes and it was it was really difficult and it was a really hard time and I ended up not finishing um, for a few different reasons but more just because I w ended up on the national team and that was taking up all of my time and energy and because I didn't feel comfortable there at school so I wasn't really motivated to be there and that was probably one of the times where I felt the least included at in any point of my life. Mm, thank you for sharing. I hope you uh, sent some clips of you broadcasting wheelchair basketball to BCIT with a note saying, I actually am a broadcaster. <laughs> um, Stuart, over to you. Thanks, Andrea. Um, I'll give a couple of examples. And I, again, I've been uh, incredibly blessed and fortunate in, in my life to have a, a lot of positive experiences. But I, I would frame this in, in two examples being one, uh, one personal, one professional. And, and the personal one may be surprising. It's surprising to me. And it's essentially on, on my travels. And I've had, you know, the, the opportunity to live in some fabulous countries. I spent nearly three or four years in New Zealand and, and Spain uh, as an individual. And um, absolutely phenomenal experiences, but there was always that sense of not belonging in that environment. And, and when I look back on that, I, I look at two, two components. And for me, um, life is about memories and sharing memories with, with, with loved ones and people there. So when you're actually having these experiences, and I think that's why, again, I was so in tune with team sport. When you, when you lose and win as a team, uh, when you have those highs and the lows, to do that in an environment where you're with people and create those memories together is something special. So one of the aspects for me, going to different countries, although people look, talk, um, you know, very, very similar to, to where I grew up in the UK, there are very subtle differences. And I think the biggest part is being away from family and friends and your immediate support network you lose that sense of belonging in, in, in many cases. So while I was on tropical beaches, you know, working with some fantastic people, there was that hole that was always there. And that hole was the people that I were 100% connected to in, in family, uh, family and friends. So that was an interesting piece for me. You know, you have these dreams of moving to these exotic countries, especially when it's winter in Canada, but then you always realize that what's most important in your life. And you always attribute that to the people in your life. And so when you haven't got those people with you to share those experiences, uh, it does leave that, that, that hole there. I think on the professional side, one thing that was really apparent to me, and it's, it's really driven me in my career choices, was when I started out in education and I was working one-on-one uh, -on -one with uh, children who uh, required additional accommodations uh, in the classroom. And I was constantly told by administration what they can't do and what I can't do with them. And I realized here that if I'm experiencing this in this class, in this school, in this area, wow, we've got a big problem on the global scale. And so for me, I realized at that time in my career, I didn't belong in that position. And I challenged myself to be in the position where I can influence systemic change and change at, at a larger scale. And that's influence every decision that I've made in my career to be in a position where I can make decisions and I can, can create that change that, um, that needs to happen. Wow, that's awesome. What a motivating factor for you to figure that out early and be able to kind of drive that forward in all of the career path that you've created for yourself. Amazing. Um, so tell us a little bit, maybe, and Stuart, we'll start with you, kind of reflecting back on belonging in self. And, you know, you've obviously done quite a bit of reflection in the story you just shared about personal 
how do you believe that accepting yourself factors into our belonging journeys? What does that look and feel like for you? That's a, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, for me, that's something that's become really prevalent over the past couple of years in my role as CEO. Um, I've worked in inclusion and accessibility for, for over a decade now, but I've not always been as open and authentic about my struggles uh, with, with uh, disability, in particular mental health illness. And for me, um, taking over uh, the leadership of an organization that's solely focused on creating inclusive and accessible communities, if there was ever a time for me to be authentic, it, it, the time is now. And so I think what that's given me in terms of, of um, belonging in self is to acknowledge that we're all on a journey, that we're all at different stages of our journey, uh, that we'll struggle at, time, uh, struggle at times, and that's okay. And I think more so that when you share some or show some vulnerability, it gives people permission to do the same. And that was my biggest drivers um, in, in trying to be true to myself so I can be more effective in my role and allow others to do the same. And so after I uh, addressed the all staff last year in terms of who am I, not my title, not my position, not my budget responsibilities, but who I am and why I'm here, it was remarkable and, and, and heartwarming to see how many of the team came up to me after and, and said what they were going through and how they feel that they can be part of an environment where they can be their authentic selves. And so I think for me, it's, it's, it's about being honest with yourself. It's knowing, knowing um, you know, your struggles, being vulnerable and showing that. And once we all do that, um, or, or, or are confident and comfortable doing that, the cascading effect is, is, is transformational in creating environments where everyone can then feel that sense of a sense of belonging. It's getting to that stage. That's the hardest, the hardest part. Yeah, absolutely. And thank you for that. I want to circle back to how you're facilitating that in the team that you have there in a minute. But um, first, I'm going to flip it to Marnie for her response um, to that same question around belonging and self. I think uh, for me, um, that's a really tough question. Um, there's been a lot of different stages where I have to reevaluate and reassess throughout my life. And I think um, having those skills from um, being on the national team and doing a lot of that mental training and mental preparation really helped me um, be able to understand um, where and when I needed help. And I think that was one of the biggest challenges for me being stubborn and hard headed was asking for help and accepting um, people's help. So once I realized that my life would be a lot easier if I would just not try and do everything myself, but to accept the help that others were offering me or ask for it when I needed it, um, it really changed the way I looked at the world. And it made, it made me understand that people, a lot of times um, when people are offering me help, it wasn't necessarily because when I always would think that, oh, they don't think I'm capable, so that's why they're offering it. But I think a lot of times people were offering it because it actually made them feel better to help. And so once I realized that and was able to accept that and, and not look at myself as being this person with a disability that needs all this assistance, but I'm a person that can maybe help someone else feel a bit better about themselves by maybe helping me with something that um, I needed help with. So it, it's been, I think, and as a woman, we go through a lot of different stages in life. Not that men don't too, sorry to reference it that way, but um, having to reevaluate at certain ages uh, uh, what priorities and um, health and fitness and those kinds of things. Once I stopped um, being on the national team, I really didn't pay attention much to my own personal fitness and it really impacted my mental health a lot more than I had realized until I was really out of shape and overweight. So to, getting back to that, um, paying attention to, to myself in terms of my personal health really also helped my mental health and just my sense of, my overall sense of self. Wow, you've both given us such beautiful examples of how you're living that story and exploring that and finding your ways forward. 
Um, I'm going to circle back to one of Stuart's uh, comments kind of around that whole inclusive leadership piece and how if you show up as vulnerable and allow people to know you, the types of cultures that creates in your organization. And so Stuart, do you want to maybe dive into a little bit around sort of I know you've been so clear about like stating your values and in COVID, um, the values of the Ability Center and how that's guiding you and shaping those decisions. And then, you know, you layer on your vulnerability and sharing your story. Like, how is that all playing out in terms of the organizational culture that you're creating around that sense of belonging? It's a, it's, it's a good question. I, I think um, for, for me, it's, um, uh, really embracing that whole concept of of co-designing environments and especially for persons that we serve and persons of lived experience that is absolutely crucial so when we look at talking about culture um in my experience there's so many different interpretations of what culture is uh, and i think defining what culture is for your organization and your and, and individual roles that serve the organization is absolutely integral to actually creating an environment which you want to which you want to see and realize um, for me, um, in what I've tried to do here is obviously my role is to, to shape the direction of the organization, but I'm not the one doing the work. Uh, and so my job is to serve the people that serve the organization. So really that embrace that concept of servant leadership. To do that, you have to know your people. You have to understand their needs. You have to provide an environment where they can fully contribute and be themselves. And so everything we've done uh, from um, our response to COVID and the reopening of our, of our organization has been based on the principles of co-design. So we've created a standard that we want to achieve in terms of a reimagined ability center experience, but it's been our team and our community that we serve that have informed what that actually looks like. And we're in a position now where um, our team feel like they can own the space. They've got ownership of the, 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 the processes and practices that we've, we've put in place. And it's, it's pretty incredible to see, um, I think, that the, the, the level of comfort in a rapidly changing environment. And that was my biggest intent is, well, was um, five or six months ago to support our staff, knowing that the initial feedback we got was people were very concerned about coming back to work, people were more concerned about themselves, their health, the health of their family and others. Whereas now, because we've invested so much time in working with our team and co-creating these standards, we feel like a unit, we feel like a tight family and we and everyone knows that we're here to take care of one another. Now, obviously the, the, the proof in, is gonna be in the pudding in terms of consistency in that. And so I've done a lot of talk as CEO, the senior leadership have done a lot of talk. Now it's up to us as, as a senior leadership team and as an organization to continue to deliver and providing those environments where people can can be themselves and have ownership and authority in their, in their positions as well. So. I would say just to, to, to cap it off, um, it's been a really unique learning experience uh, with re regards to my leadership style these past few months. Um, but to create the culture that we want to see, you have to have that vulnerability, but you have to give ownership in that co-design and co-production of the environment that you want to create. And that's something that we've embraced and will continue to embrace as an organization. Oh, I love that so much. You need, uh, you need to be out speaking to other leaders in our spaces and sectors because uh, we need more of that. Marnie, I'm going to flip it over to you. Um, tell us about Let's Play. I mean, it's such an incredible program. It uh, just gives, I mean, one, you, you say it's the best job in the world, but I've witnessed <laughs> Like it's just so beautiful and such an incredible opportunity for kids to play and to normalize wheelchairs as part of sporting equipment and to create this really fun, engaging atmosphere for um, kids of all abilities to participate. So tell us a little bit about sort of how you bring that sense of belonging to that and how you're training others and supporting others to um, create that culture for kids. Uh, well, I, Let's Play was uh, sort of, it was started in 2009 um, and by a gentleman named Mike Prescott and Carrie Linegar. We had identified a gap in our LTAD, which was, LTAD was just sort of becoming the buzz around that time. And um, we had, we would have kids that would come to want to play wheelchair basketball when they were 14 or 15 who had never learned the skill of wheeling. They couldn't catch or throw. They had basically no fundamental movement skills at all and weren't starting from scratch. So 
we thought we needed to find these kids a little bit earlier and just introduce them to that skill of wheeling um, and then help them develop some of their fundamental mo movement skills. And in the process, we realized um, how important it was, not just for the children with disabilities, but for all their peers and classmates as well. And it kind of blossomed from there. I think that we, um, we, uh, we look at ourselves as being inclusive, but in the, in the lens of the last few uh, months of what's been going on in the world, we've had to really reassess and relook at that as well. But with the Let's Play program, <clears throat> we're just able to help parents navigate a bit of a large, gloomy looking system sometimes when they're involved in the medical system. A lot of, of our kids are, have congenital disabilities, so they're born with their disabilities and they've spent their young years in physiotherapy or in surgeries or having medical procedures or sitting on the sidelines or in the library during PE and recess. And so um, just letting the parents know that there is an opportunity for their child to play just like any other child. And it's actually seeing the faces of the parents um, watching their kids just having fun is one of the most rewarding things about the Let's Play program because sometimes it, they just don't even realize that their child can just play like any other child. So um, just that little small seed is a seed that can grow into many different opportunities and the motivation and self-confidence that develops in the kids with disabilities is just huge. And it's hard to measure those types of impacts and we can't put them down in statistics with numbers, but we can see it in the children that we work with and with their classmates. And so it's, it's, a, it's a program that's not only helping these kids develop their fundamental movement skills and their sport skills, um, but it's also encouraging um, an openness and an, an inclusive environment in their schools and in their communities. And Andrea, you'll be happy to know we just got a beautiful jumpstart grant for Pisces and Victoria for a fleet of uh, wheelchairs for the school district in the greater Victoria area and we will be mentoring the teachers um, in terms of physical literacy and the skill of wheeling and offering those kinds of things. So yeah, having the opportunity to share some of my experiences as an athlete and a coach and to share with some of the leaders the importance of um, making sure every child gets an opportunity to play is, is one of the great um, things about Let's Play but also just giving these kids the opportunity to play. I mean, just to go out and play. Last year, we opened an awesome playground in Surrey that was just this amazing facility that was so inclusive and so accessible. And just to see all the varieties of kids, able-bodied and kids with disabilities, all different types, just playing and having fun in that environment was just such a great experience. And the mayor of Surrey, I think, was just blown away um, by what this playground did for their community and and it's happening in other communities too so it's it's not just a single child that's impacted by it it's a real like a drop in the water a real ripple effect and that's one of the things that i think has made the program so successful that's awesome um so marnie within all of that like how does your story show up in that how are you influencing the experience of those kids to help ensure that they feel like this is their place and they're developing skills that will help them navigate sport life um, friendships those types of pieces how does that all come together for you and how are you moving that um, basically, we just have fun. I, I get to play. I mean, maybe that's why I love my job because I can play late with all the five and six and 10 year olds, right? So um, it, it's just about having fun. And when, when everybody's having fun, um, it's easy to feel included. And what we do with Let's Play is we encourage uh, the kids to bring their siblings or their friends and making sure they're comfortable to get started. And sometimes they're not ready just to jump in and play. Like we expect every child just to be like, oh, wow, this is awesome. And sometimes they're scared. And so they'd have to watch for a little while. And sometimes their brother or sister jumps out and plays first or mom or dad will hop in a chair and just, you know, it, sometimes it takes a little bit of time to kind of ease them in. But once they get into the sports chair and we wheel around and see how freely and quickly they can move, it's, it's, it just, it's, a, it's different for every child in terms of how we include them and how um, their transition goes into it. Uh, but we really just take the time to kind of get to know the children and what their needs are and 
some of the things they like to do. And we've actually, um, during COVID, been able to offer some virtual programming and it's been fun to, we've been dancing and doing some different types of activities that we wouldn't have normally done in a face-to-face -face environment. So it's been a great way to connect with um, some kids that aren't necessarily the sportiest kids or don't really see themselves as being sporty, but still, you know, can be physically active. And so it's really um, opened up a lot of doors and actually really made us rethink some of our programming and how we're going to go forward with it. I don't know if that answered your question quite. <laughs> that was good. Um, yeah, lots of learnings for both of you during COVID for sure in terms of how we might do things differently. Um, we did get a question in the chat. It was sent to me privately, so I'm just going to read it out. Does anyone think that municipal municipality run recreation centers should offer wheelchair sport as mainstream sport? Right now, wheelchair sports are usually run by community organized clubs rather than the city or municipality. Sometimes they're not accessible as the leaders are not as open to new ideas and new approaches as the two as our two amazing speakers are. So either of you have an opinion on that question? I can I can speak to it a little bit from my experience here in BC. Um, we've got a great partner in the city of Surrey who are willing to do anything and everything when it comes to adaptive sport. I think with communities um, and in com particular community center programs, they usually require a minimum um, number of registrants. And uh, oftentimes when they offer an adaptive program, they might get one or two kids uh, who register. And so it's not that they don't see the value in offering the program, but they really can't afford to offer the program. And so we've tried to mitigate some of those issues by offering to pay up the registrations to whatever number their requirement is or helping them promote it in a different way and making sure they're offering it to other um, kids, not just with, specifically for kids with disabilities. And I think that's key is how the programs are promoted. I, I think there is a willingness in communities to do it. It's just, they need a little bit of uh, mentorship and some ideas on how best to make it successful. Because even if there are only one or two kids, it's not that much fun for them either. So they might show up the first night and be like, I'm, this is boring, I'm not coming back, right? But if they come to a program where there's six or eight kids, then they definitely come back. And so making sure that they have a good first experience and helping the communities and the, the leaders understand what it's gonna take in order to do that. It's not always just about equipment, it's about getting bodies and, and more people to participate. And wheelchair basketball has been such a great example of a sport that offers reverse inclusion. So really making sure that it is accessible to anyone, regardless if they have a disability or not, but they actually intentionally have a classification system that includes individuals without a disability so that it can bolster the numbers and facilitate exactly what you were just speaking about, Marnie. Yeah, we might not want to mention classification <laughs> at this point in time. There. <laughs> um, Stuart, do you want to comment on that question? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a good question and my, my initial response is absolutely. We need as many different versions of recreation, sport and play in municipalities across this whole country. And I think to, to, to Marnie's point is it, there's not necessarily a, an, an unwillingness to do it, but there's a certain mindset, mindset and culture in place that is preventing those opportunities from, from happening. And, I think how we position it in terms of really just how can we embrace the concept of universally designed play and how can we support mass participation through play and, and what we've trying to do, uh, what we've done at Ability Centre and try and do is, is ensure that we've got variations for all of the programs and, and activities that we run. So regardless of your, your ability, your playing level, that you can be accommodated straight off the S offset and you can choose how you want to engage in that activity. And so uh, we've taken that a step further with the launch of Mixability Sport in partnership with International Mixability Sport uh, Association who are based in the UK. And Mixability Sport is, is basically looking at what variations can be applied in different sporting environments to support mass participation. Uh, rugby is a, a big focus, obviously fairly biased with, with, with my background. Um, and we've been working with um, uh, Rugby Ontario and a number of local clubs 
Um, we've actually uh, launched Mixability Rugby um, in, uh, uh, in the Durham region, and we had 80 families signed up for the first session indoors in the winter. And during COVID, we've got 20 families signed up at the local club. And that's the big focus for us is, it's not about Ability Centre doing all the work. It's about us supporting municipalities, clubs, and community organisations to become autonomous and do it this themselves. And I think that's the value of what municipalities provide and what the club structure provides. It's a social inclusion piece as well, that if we provide these opportunities, it's not just the hour of being physically active, it's being able to connect with your community where you live, work, and play. And what I cherish when I go to the mixability on Friday nights isn't throwing a rugby ball around. It's having the pint of beer in the, in the club with all of the participants after and having that environment that our, some of our participants with disabilities have never been exposed to uh, before. So again, I think we've got to look how we position the value. It's not just um, people turning up, but how, how municipally driven inclusive programs can really enhance the social fabric of those, those communities. And I think, you know, for both of you and certainly my work, it's been about trying to build those education pieces so that there's that understanding that you can create variations and alternatives and, you know, things don't need to be done the way they've been done. They can be done in ways that allow for um, accessibility for a whole range of uh, abilities as we go forward. So thank you. That was a great example. Um, I want to go kind of back and forth a little bit. Um, one of the pieces, Stuart, earlier that you talked about was, you know, in your inclusive leadership, um, sort of the creating the, that space for people to co-create solutions and to work together on what that might look like. The piece that struck me is what where does where do mistakes show up in that? How do you create the space for mistakes, and what does that look like when they happen? And how do you support people through them? Yeah, that's a that's a really a really good question. I, I hope I didn't sound it make make it sound easy because it's absolutely not uh, easy. I think um, for me, mistakes is where growth and development happens. And if you're very clear and articulate about it's okay to fail at times, it's it's failing to learn. That's my biggest concern. Um, we've got a really phenomenal team of talent here at Ability Centre, a very young, dynamic team. And what I want to make it clear to them is, is number one, that there's, there's, I guess there's different types of failure. Um, if you fail in activity-based um, uh, outcomes, i.e. we haven't met a program target, we haven't met an outcome, I can live with that or a budget, I can live with those types of mistakes and we can repivot and we can examine, you know, how we can bridge and fix those areas. If it's a values based mistake, then that's where we have to have more deep and meaningful discussions. Um, and I think it's really clarifying to the team about mistakes are going to happen. It's the ability to, to, to learn from those mistakes that provide an opportunity for growth and development but be very conscious about where we're making those mistakes um, um, because the values ones and the cultural pieces are what's most important. Everything else can be fixed, but you know, culture in many cases can't be fixed. It needs to be dismantled and, and cut out and then rebuilt. And so that's kind of the, 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 the process that I, I, I look at it as well. The other aspect as well is, is trying to ensure that, that, that my team and even myself embraces the concept of innovation. And when you think about COVID-19, none of us want to be in this situation. But I think we can all agree that this situation has exposed such inequities in our society, in our communities, in our systems, that we are being forced in a position to face this adversity and innovate to come out better and stronger. And so it's about trying to be um, um, cognizant of the innovation that exists in these challenging situations while at the same time knowing what you need to feel safe, to take care of yourself and to belong, to be able to, to pivot and, and innovate in, in that. So, so that's what I, I, I look at the types of mistakes. I, I try and remind people in terms of, you know, um, good mistakes to make and, and the bad mistakes to make, but also how every challenge is an opportunity to, to grow, essentially. Fantastic. Thank you. 
Um, so Marnie, I'm going to turn a similar question to you within sort of the influencer role that you have um, in the work that you're doing and the promotion of accessibility and opportunities for kids to play. How do you take um, examples where someone falls down, doesn't quite do what you're asking them to do, makes a wrong comment or you know kind of does the wrong thing in a situation makes a mistake how do you support them in moving through that so that they stay engaged and want to keep um, working on their inclusion journey usually it's me that does that so <laughs> uh, i think one of the biggest things is we just encourage people to try and you know what if you do make a mistake or if you fail or fall you just get back up and then I think that's one of the things about having a disability is that um, I think people will look at me or can talk to me and feel comfortable in the understanding that um, maybe I kind of do know what I'm talking about because I have the lived experience of it and, and sometimes that encourages people to be a little bit braver um, and I think I agree 100% with everything Stuart said it's it's um, it's giving the people the opportunities, whether they, whether they are successful or not successful, at least they've had the opportunity. And that's the thing that we need to look at ourselves as an organization is if we're providing that or not. And I know with Let's Play, we do have some kids that fall through the cracks and we have been working with um, Connect Autism Network and some other partners to try and um, meet the needs of some of those children, but we're not able to um, meet the needs of every single child with a disability in the province, unfortunately. And we do have a fairly specific demographic that we are targeting. Um, and sometimes when I have to say no to somebody in terms of them asking for a sports chair, I'm fine if I can say, actually, no, we can't do that. But here, go see the folks at Sportability or go talk to these folks or, you know, the other people that can provide it. It's when I can't refer them to something that's going to help them is when I find it the most difficult. And that's where I feel like we do fail sometimes is when we can't help a specific situation or a specific family. And that's probably one of our toughest challenges with Let's Play. Yeah, um, I've said for years, I know you've, you've heard me say it, that we need Let's Play across the country to support kids and families for those introductions to movement and um, and to normalize chairs as part of the sporting equipment. Um, I'm going to flip back uh, to kind of what both of you have said, but I'm going to really pinpoint it. Um, both of you have articulated in your responses to that last question around mistakes, the concept of psychological safety. So creating that space for us to make mistakes, creating the spaces for us to show up as we want and need, um, in both of your lived experiences and stories you've shared with us today, you've both articulated, you know, your journey through discovering psychological safety and how you show up as well. So tell us a little bit about psychological safety and how that's influenced your belonging journey and how it influences how you're working with your organizations and the work you do now. Stuart, you want to go first? Yeah, for sure. Uh, that's a that's a really good question. I, I think for me, um, you know, psychological safety is multifaceted, and uh, I, I'll use a couple of examples, both what we do internally as an organisation and, and and what I try and, and and foster as well as what we've done with our with our, our our members and and constituents. And I think for me, you know, psychological safety is a a string of experiences that happen before you get in that space. Uh, and, and a great example um, um, is the reopening of our center, for example, for our members and constituents. We've talked about a reimagined ability center experience. The experience starts long before someone walks or wheels in our building. It, it starts with the communication, the accessible communication that we get about the steps that we're taking to meet that individual's needs, what to expect, how they can actually you know, participate in what's going on in the, in, in the center at that time. So before they even come to engaging in an activity, they've got an expectation and a standard, and we've actually start to ease some of that anxiety around that return. And that's what we found when we surveyed uh, a lot of our members and constituents was that the majority of people were really excited to come back and become engaged with activity, 
at the same rate, they were also had the same level of anxiety. So we've got to really embrace that and, and understand that. And I think that's also um, translated when you look to foster those, um, uh, those safe environments and psychological safety with staff. You know, um, I've got a great title. Um, I don't always resonate with my title. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, I like to think of myself as a, as a person of the people. You know, I, I, I've worked in nearly every role that each one of my staff has done throughout, throughout the years. But just having that title in the room, you know, puts up a barrier for some of the younger staff to be able to engage and, and ask questions. So uh, what we're trying to do, and, and by no means am I, am I an expert uh, at this, I've got a lot of work to do in this area, is again, how can we it, think about psychological safety well in advance before that engagement happens? It has to come in the fabric of how we communicate to our team, to our people. It has to come through how we represent ourselves. We have to be present in the lives of our staff. I can't just sit in my ivory tower, nine to five, Monday to Friday. I need to be on the floor, integrating, speaking about people. How are they doing? Not how they perform, but how are they doing as people and understand that I care about them and that they feel that, that, that care and that the organization cares about them. When, you kind of, when you've got that level of understanding and that sense of comfort and safety, that's when you can really start to engage in, in the deep and meaningful conversations and you establish a certain level of psychological safety where you can really advance the organization's uh, goals and, uh, uh, and objectives. And I think also it's, it's really key about, and I, sh I really struggle with not having answers to everything. Um, and so I've been challenging myself to, in, in meetings, um, not give answers and responses. And stuff. I'm not the expert, you are the experts. What do you think? How do you think we can improve? What do you need to be successful? What are you hearing from the people we serve? And give individuals ownership and the ability to be able to go away and execute on those areas with our support in a, in a, in a safe environment. So for me, it's, it's about um, you know, a string of experiences that contribute to someone uh, achieving a level of psychological safety where they can uh, fully engage. Great answer. I, I love the uh, trying to not give answers. It is so much easier sometimes, right? But it's like, oh, that's not the point. Um, Marnie, over to you. Um, I, really similar to, to what Stu is mentioning. I think one of the things uh, we try to do is to build a relationship um, with each family. And trust is a really big part of our, our programming and our ability to um, help these kids feel safe and the parents too. And I think uh, we work directly with the families and a lot of times with teachers individually, one-on-one, -on -one, just initially getting started. And we've tried a few times um, and I, it was my mistake early on. We, I would bring a kid in who's brand new, trying to come and get a Let's Play chair into a tournament where there was a CWBL tournament or some big junior thing going on. And they would come in the gym and just be like, whoa, wow, what is going on? And it was too overwhelming. And it, we really learned a lot um, during those early years on how to introduce the program and how to bring kids in. And, and we found like the most successfully is within their own classroom where they're already in a, in a safe environment with their teacher and their classmates seem to be the most successful. Uh, the other thing, we have a really great uh, communications manager, Michelle, she's actually on the call today. Um, and we show a lot of pictures, all of the stuff that we promote, we show pictures of kids playing um, and different types of abilities, different types of activities. And I think um, when parents or teachers see those pictures or videos, they can really identify with the child that they're working with or with their own child and to sort of how they fit in or if they fit in. So like they say, like a picture says a thousand words, it, it definitely does in, in our world for sure. And so, but building that trust and, and having um, that one-on-one -on -one relationship is really important. And BC is a big province. So we're not always able to do that. And sometimes we would have a representative from our club um, or one of our school partners uh, making that relationship and making that connection, which actually leads to ongoing participation because eventually they could be playing within that club. So it sometimes helps as a recruitment tool for them as well to be involved in the, in the early years, even though that's not necessarily what their mandate as a club might be. Some great examples, thank you. 
Um, as always happens on uh, Bridges of Belonging, we're right towards the end of our time. So I'm going to turn it over to each of you to give us sort of a last word. Um, uh, it can be a reflection on today, a piece of uh, your belonging journey, whatever you'd like to share to close us off with our audience. So Marnie, do you want to go first? Sure. Uh, first, I'd just like to say thank you, Andrea, because these um, sessions that you're doing are amazing and the people that you're bringing together across the country uh, it's so great I think it's just a fantastic opportunity I mean when I first met Stuart he was working with the CPC on their physical literacy tools um, that are still being used today and they, he really inspired me actually in a lot of the let's play um, activities and stuff with the stuff that he was doing back then so I think connecting and reconnecting people is really important during these times and so thank you for doing that and I, I, I would just like to um, reiterate the fact that I, I'm really lucky. Um, I was looking back at my high school yearbook during the summer. I was at my parents place. My mom was pulling stuff out of the basement and my, um, when I graduated from high school my dream was to travel the world. So I guess I kind of did that, but not really in the way that I had expected to. So we were just laughing and joking about it. But I've been really lucky, I think, in my life with the opportunities that I've had as an athlete, as a coach, um, being involved with broadcasting some of the Paralympics and those kinds of things. It's, it's, um, it's a community and a world that is just so awesome to be a part of. And I, I feel like I, it was pretty much my destiny, I guess. I don't feel angry or disappointed that I am living a life with a disability. I feel lucky um, to have had the opportunities that I've had and to be able to keep sort of sharing um, the message of Paralympics and inclusion and adaptive sport. And I think it's made our, I'm, it's made me a better person being involved um, in in this community and i feel really lucky to have had the opportunities that i have so thank you andrea for being a big part of that and for your work with the with the cpc and same with you Stu. Aww, thanks marnie wow you're trying to make us cry at the end of it <laughs> <laughs> um Stuart, i'm going to turn it over to you yeah, thank, thanks, Marnie. Thank, and um, I agree with um, uh, Marnie, Andrea. Thanks for facilitating these. It's I'm, I'm looking at some of the names uh, on the on the screen, and along with Marnie and yourself, there's just some phenomenal people that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, nearly a decade now since my uh, my time in Canada. And uh, I think if 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 I, I left the group with one thing to uh, to, to think about is um, I think all of us, um, uh, obviously we're on the line today because we're committed to inclusion and accessibility and so much of our lives, it's in a job, it's, it's, a, it's a life uh, and it's a life, um, a lifelong ambition to see the change that we wanna see. And um, I always refer back to a, a quote from Nelson Mandela, um, which he says, it always seems impossible until it's done. And I think there is a unique moment in our history uh, as society uh, coming out of COVID-19 to really start to drive the change that we want to see. Uh, but we're not going to do that if we don't unite and come together. And to, to Marnie's point, the connections that we have here, uh, we need to amplify those connections. We need to give a voice to those that don't have a voice. But we need to embrace this opportunity coming out of this pandemic especially to really start to create the type of society that we want to see. And if there ever, ever was an opportunity in the window to do it, it's now. And uh, to, to Marnie's point, I am incredibly fortunate enough to do what I love for a living. Um, I've had a fantastic um, experience in sport and market. I do an inclusion and accessibility and um, I, I'm, I'm excited to work with, with, with like-minded folks to, to really drive some of that change forward in the coming months and years. Awesome. Thank you. Well, thank you to both of you because Bridges of Belonging only happens because I have incredible humans that say yes. <laughs> so I'm always so grateful. And um, it's just been such a beautiful opportunity to hear stories that often we don't get to hear because as leaders doing the work we're doing, we're talking about the work and not about ourselves. And so um, I just feel so fortunate that people are willing to be vulnerable and to share their stories and for us to learn together about how we 
stop commodifying the diversity and inclusion conversation and make it about the people that are at the core of why we're passionate about the work we do and about creating a better world together and finding some different ways forward. So thank you to both of you for uh, being here. Michelle's just put in the chat, best session yet. So um, that's a uh, credit to both of you. So I'm just going to uh, wrap us up by again saying thank you to Stuart and Marnie so, so much. I'm so grateful. Um, that you were both here. And Marnie, it was suiting that you uh, brought up Jumpstart earlier because I know both of you, um, your programs really benefit from Jumpstart and there are beneficiary this month. We always do a donation as a thank you to our speakers. And so Jumpstart is our beneficiary this month. So that was well, uh, well timed for both of you. Um, I'm also just gonna quickly share our upcoming speakers. So we have um, a session again in two weeks on, um, uh, Bridges of Belonging that will feature Samantha Rogers and Normal Riley and um, we're going to talk about the sponsorship and the philanthropic side of uh, our worlds and um, how belonging can show up in those and how they can be influencers. The fund development side can be influencers and in how we move belonging forward. And then I also and so that's October 6 at 11 a.m. PT. And then I also want to give a shout out, Fanny Smith's on the line, and um, Fanny is going to host our first French Bridges of Belonging next week, next Wednesday. And um, we have uh, Maxime Gagné from uh, Defi Sportif lined up to be on that, and then also Cindy Olette. So you can register for both of those sessions on uh, the website, inclusionincorporated.com slash events. So I hope to see you all there. Thank you again so much. Have an amazing day and uh, take care and be well.